Now, this is meant to be, I've got a talk prepared, but let's shut the doors and if you have any questions, be interactive, put your hand up and shout, okay? I'm happy to be interrupted. So, that's for you to be inquisitive. So, when, if you have lymphoma, and both Hodgkin's, and I'm talking about Hodgkin's lymphoma, large cell lymphoma, and low-grade lymphoma. So I've got case presentations in each of those. So depending how old you are and what sort of lymphoma you have, what happens? So you can see on the left, left there, this is a very general slide. Depends, as you can see there, whether you have an aggressive lymphoma or a low-grade lymphoma, where it's relapsed, uh, time to relapse, what previous therapy you've had, what's your age and fitness, and then what the physician uh, decides to do. So for example, if you have low-grade lymphoma, it's been in remission for five years and it relapses in one site, we're not going to do a transplant with you, we might just irradiate and leave you alone. Concomitantly, if you have Hodgkin's lymphoma that recurs and you're generally under the age of 60 to 65, or if you have large cell lymphoma and it recurs, generally we will treat you fairly aggressively with salvage chemotherapy and the option of a, have, having a bone marrow transplant, which is probably what I'm going to talk about today. So, the point is, so I'm going to focus on younger fit patients at the moment. I'm going to be talking about older patients later on. So each case is different. So it's, you know, it's very difficult to give a general talk about relapsed lymphoma. So when we talk about young fit patients, young doesn't necessarily to determine by your age, it's determined by your, by, by your fitness. Because we see people who are 68 who are marathon runners, who are, haven't been drinkers, haven't been smokers, who are really fit. And we see people who are 52 who are really knocked out by boozing and drinking and womanising and all sorts of stuff. So, so there's a difference, but you know, it's, it's your biological age rather than your chronological age. So generally, for the most patients, the more aggressive lymphomas will give salvage chemotherapy and consider about having a transplant. And there's lots of factors to discuss, and I'll go through some cases about transplant discussion. So the two forms of transplant, forgive me for, for stating the obvious to some people who may know about this, one form of transplant is an autograft. And the idea behind an autograft is you give salvage chemotherapy, you get a response of the lymphoma to that, you collect the patient's stem cells. These are stem cells that are normally stuck in the bone marrow, but under certain circumstances they can be mobilised from the bone marrow into the blood and collect on a particular machine. And those stem cells are then collected and frozen down in liquid nitrogen. And then if it's appropriate, people go ahead and have a transplant. Generally, if they have responsiveness to the cell with chemotherapy, they get high-dose chemotherapy, which is designed to blast the lymphoma and cure it by high-dose chemotherapy mechanisms, but also kills the bone marrow at the same time. And then you reinfuse those stem cells. You take them out of the liquid nitrogen. You thaw them. You reinfuse them back into the patient. And over about a two-week period, it reconstitutes their blood counts. So that's the common, if you go up to the ward at the OSS at the moment, you'll see patients having an autograft. And generally they're in hospital for about two to two and a half weeks. They have their chemotherapy. The chemotherapy can, then gets metabolised out of their system. Their stem cells are then reinfused uh, through it like a blood transfusion. And these stem cells miraculously find their way back to the bone marrow and, and grow again. And that takes about 10 to 12 days for them to grow again. And during that period of time, patients to have low blood counts and then to look after in hospital. The other form of transplant is having a, a transplant from somebody else, usually a sibling or more commonly these days an unrelated donor. Um, and the idea behind that is also to try and destroy the lymphoma by chemotherapy, but not in all cases because sometimes we actually use a relatively low dose chemotherapy prior to a transplant from another donor. And in those cases we more particularly rely on the immune effect of the donor cells. And so there are some lymphomas, particularly low-grade lymphoma, and I'll show you a case later on, in which the donor immune system growing in the patient has high effectiveness against eradicating the patient's lymphoma cells. And probably if you're going to order the immune effectiveness of donor stem cells, low-grade lymphoma is the most responsive to that effect. Hodgkin's lymphoma to a less extent and more aggressive lymphomas to a much lesser extent. So not uncommonly for young patients with relapsed low-grade lymphoma, we'll do an allograft. Occasionally we'll do it in Hodgkin's lymphoma, but not particularly frequently, and very rarely, rarely in large cell lymphoma. So just to give you a, a, um, 
uh, perception. We got our data out from the Austin over the last three to four years. You can see the number of transplants we've done there, and the vast majority for a condition called multiple myeloma. And we don't do that many for lymphoma because the majority of patients are cured. So the majority, the, the cure rate with Hodgkin's lymphoma is about, um, for early stage disease, is more than 90%. For advanced stage disease, it's about 80, 80 to 80, 85%. For low-grade lymphoma, our recent results have been excellent with the new combinations of chemotherapy, so we don't do a lot of autographs for that. And again, as you can see, with the addition of rituximab, the survival and improvement has improved with large cell lymphoma, so we do less autographs for large cell lymphoma than we would have done a decade ago. So, I just like to put pretty slides in sometimes just to keep you awake. <laughs> so, relapsed Hodgkin's lymphoma. So, this is uh, one of Professor Engert's slides, so it's in German. And so it's, it's a C there and it's A over there. Anyway, so, the reason I put a Hodgkin's lymphoma is because while Hodgkin's lymphoma is not as common as non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, it's more relatively common from a transplant point of view because it occurs in a younger age patient. So you can see here that the peak incidence of the large or more, sorry, the non Hodgkin lymphoma is in the seventh decade, and that's why we have issues with treating older patients who may not be eligible for transplants. Whereas the majority of Hodgkin's patients are younger patients, and that's why consideration of transplants is more of an issue. And the perspective is that in patients with advanced Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is sort of all over the body at diagnosis, that the current chemotherapy regimens cure roughly 80% of patients. You may have mentioned before that I took there are various chemotherapy regimens for Hodgson's lymphoma. Professor Engert's group uh, is very keen on a very aggressive regimen, um, uh, which probably gives a higher cure rate initially, but has toxicity such as infertility and other issues as well. So there's a big debate in, in Hodgson's lymphoma about optimal treatment up front. We, we can talk about that later on. People who present with limited stage Hodgson's disease, for example, just in the neck, the relapse rate's very rare. So if we have a typical patient with Hodgkin's lymphoma that we treat with chemotherapy and their PET scans hopefully in remission, but unfortunately the PET scan is not entirely predictive. Those of you who know, may know in the room that PET scans are good for lymphoma and if you have a negative PET scan it's a very positive thing to have, but it doesn't guarantee that you're not going to relapse, unfortunately. And generally if they relapse, we give them a combination chemotherapy there, it's called ice, it's not the drug ice that, that people take, it's something else. And in fact, in, in younger patients, we actually double the doses of some of these chemo uh, chemotherapy drugs. Now, it's a somewhat unsatisfactory area, really, because we are relying on, we've heard a lot about new therapies at the moment for uh, lymphoma using monoclonal antibodies and new treatments. Hodgkin's lymphoma, the main advance is a drug called brentuximab, which I'll come to in a minute, but currently it's not available in Australia. But it would be lovely to be able to use it in this, in this context. We collect the stem cells and we do a transplant. And it cures roughly 50 to 60% of, of their patients, depending on their PET status pre-transplant. What do I mean by that? Do most people know what a PET scan is? Generally? Okay, so if you PET scan, um, interestingly, they, they, we're very lucky in Australia. We've got a plethora of PET scan machines in Germany. They only have, they only have three or four. It's interesting. Um, so if you are PET negative prior to your autograph, you have a cure rate probably about 60 to 70%. If you're PET positive, so evidence of residual disease, you're more likely to relapse. And then sometimes if you relapse after that, it gets complicated. I'll, I'll come to that. So this is a, a study, just look in, in, the, uh, in the top there. If you're PET negative prior to an autograph, your cure rate is in this study, actually from the, from the uh, Melbourne group, is about 80%. If you're PET positive, it's only about 40%. So trying to get PET negativity is very important. And if you relapse after an autograph, and you're young, we may give you some extra treatment with this drug called brentuximab, which I'll come to in a minute, and consider a transplant. So this is a, a case study. Uh, this was a, a male, he's currently in the ward at the moment, he's born in 1970, you can read it all for yourself there, um, who presented about four years ago now with uh, a mass in his chest and a biopsy showed Hodgkin's lymphoma. He had a PET scan, it was what's bulky means larger than seven and a half centimetres of any mass and he had stage two disease which means it was just above his diaphragm. And he got treated with eight cycles of ABVD, generally we would only give six but he was looked after by other people and he completed treatment and he had a residual mass but it was PET scan negative. Not uncommon to have residual mass after treatment for, for mediastinal in the middle of the chest Hodgkin's lymphoma. 
And he didn't want to have any radiotherapy, which is not unreasonable, because if you give radiotherapy to some people on the chest, you can expose their coronary arteries to radiotherapy, and there's a risk of getting heart attacks later on. So, about a year later, he got some chest symptoms, and he had another PET scan which showed relapse. So he did have a negative PET scan. As I mentioned before, it's not entirely predictive. And a biopsy showed confirmation of uh, relapsed Hodgkin's. We always try and re-biopsy patients because sometimes the positive PET scan can be something else, not necessarily lymphoma. So you always re-biopsy patients. Then he had this chemotherapy regimen that I've mentioned before and had his stem cells collected and had a transplant. And his PET scan was consistent with remission prior to his transplant. So if you remember that previous slide, we would predict about an 80% cure. But unfortunately, not that long after his, his transplant, he again, so let's go, I don't know if I go back a slide, I can't, so hold on. If I go to the previous slide, his autograph was in, 2000, in January 2011. Within a couple of months, unfortunately, he'd relapsed. And this time he agreed to have some radiotherapy and remained in remission for another 14 months. But unfortunately, then he relapsed again. So he's in a situation where he's had his transplant, he's relapsed again, he's in trouble. So, this is a curve uh, presented at a lymphoma conference that looks at the average survival in patients who relapse after a transplant for Hodgkin's lymphoma, and the median survival is not very good. So this is a real area of unmet need about how we can improve this. So is there anything new which provides more hope of a better outcome? Well, the answer is so, sort of yes. So there's this drug uh, called Brentuximab vodotin. So I, I don't want to make it too complicated, but this is, on the surface of the Hodgkin cells, we have a protein called CD30. And brentuximab is an immunoglobulin or an antibody which attaches to CD30. But in addition, it has a toxin that, in that sort of a spiky bit attached to it. So what happened is, if the antibody binds to the CD30 on the surface of the cell, it gets internalised in the cell, and it releases these little poison, these little dots here, which goes to the, the DNA in the nucleus of the cell and kills the cell. So, the results of, there was a very pivotal study done a few years ago now, in which they took patients who had Hodgkin's lymphoma, had a transplant and relapsed, and then gave brentuximab every three weeks, over 30 minutes as an outpatient, generally pretty well tolerated treatment. And you can see here, 94% of patients responded with having a tumour reduction. So this is their, this is what's called a waterfall plot. This is the amount of percentage of reduction of their tumour. So really a very highly effective therapy. And I'll just show you on the right. So not everybody got a, got a response, but those patients who got a complete response, which is CR on the top right hand corner, and that's the white curve there, actually had a very good a chance of remaining in remission. This is time, this is about a year after. So 50% of patients just with this uh, very simple antibody infusion remained in remission. So what happened with this patient, he got treated with brentuximab. Now brentuximab, we talked about cost before. The cost, forgive me Julie, I wanted to mention this. So the cost of brentuximab, the average dose for somebody would be about 130 milligrams. That costs about $16,000. Um, and so it's approved in the US and approved in Europe. It's not yet approved in Australia. And there is an application to get approved in Australia for relapsed Hodgkin's lymphoma post-transplant, but it's not currently approved. So this patient, uh, fortunately, we had a compassionate access program a few years ago where we could access brentuximab. And we had some leftover stock from that, and we also convinced the hospital to, to pay for some brentuximab for this patient. And we were able to afford to give him four cycles of treatment. The nuances are I won't go into detail. But he got a PET scan after that, after five doses, and subsequently had an unrelated donor identified and underwent a transplant. Um, he underwent his transplant, and then post transplant had a new abnormality in his armpit which was irradiated, this was uh, about six months ago now, and he currently remains in remission after his transplant. So I think the new advance in Hodgkin's lymphoma is, is, is brentuximab, um, but it's currently not available in Australia. Uh, there, are, there is a study at the Austin Hospital and some other centres around Melbourne at the moment in which patients with newly diagnosed Hodgkin's disease, 
can either get the standard chemotherapy, which is a combination called ABVD, or the B drug in ABVD can be replaced by brintuximab. So there's now sort of using it as part of initial treatment rather than relapse post-transplant. And it makes common sense to use a very effective drug early on before you've relapsed. And uh, we're hopeful that that will show a significant survival advantage and will provide the impetus for this to be uh, funded by various governments around the world. But it is not a cheap drug. And so this is just <laughs> some data from the Royal Melbourne showing if you've had an, an autograph relapse and then had an allograph, if you're in complete remission after prior to your autograph, your actual survival is good. But if you have evidence of disease and your PET scan is positive prior to an allograph, your chances of re remaining in remission are relatively small. So the idea is to try and get them with brentaximab, if we can afford it, into a PET negative remission before their second transplant. Okay. So just to start the lessons for Hodgkin's, we cure most patients, but not everybody. For those who then go ahead and have a transplant, we cure half of them, so we still have a significant percentage of patients who relapse. And it depends on your pet status. It's noisy. Brintuximab, currently not available, um, is probably the best treatment. The trouble is to get approved in Australia. What Australian evidence wants is to say, OK, well, what we want to do is to have brintuximab compared in a trial versus some other chemotherapy. That's never been done. So which my, so the onus of proof is difficult in Australia because our regulatory authorities are much tougher than those in America and Europe. Um, but probably the best way forward is to actually look at using these effective agents up front, as I've mentioned, by using brintaximab early in treatment. So just yesterday, we had a young woman from Ballarat who was diagnosed with stage 4 Hodgkin's lymphoma. We offered her the trial and she came down and agreed to participate and fortunately she was randomised to brintaximab, which I think is going to be better. Because the initial results of using this in treatment showed I think about 26 out of 27 patients obtained a remission. So that's Hodgkin's lymphoma. Are there any questions about that? I had to race through quickly because I've got to cover lots of diseases in a short period of time. Probably nobody here has Hodgkin's lymphoma, so they're saying, what the hell is he talking about? Is there any questions about that? Is that you doing the cartwheel? Uh, I think my body is a bit fatter than that now. Um, I love cross country skiing, but I don't think I could do that. Um, okay. So, what about diffuse large B cell lymphoma? So the results, you know, as Professor Engert has shown this before, that this is the old data with CHOP alone. This is your chances of, of not relapsing. And on the right, it's your overall survival. So the addition of rituximab, the R-CHOP results are good. Now, this, this curve on the right is, is generally for, for good risk patients. It's not quite as good for patients with advanced uh, large cell lymphoma. But still, the results are good, and the majority, but not all, patients that we treat with R-TROP for large cell lymphoma do very well. But the problem is that for that small percentage of patients who relapse after R-TROP treatment, they've probably got really bad lymphoma. Because those patients, um, and, and there is a suggestion that if you relapse after R-TROP, your outlook's not as good that if you relapsed after CHOP, because if you've already had rituximab and you've blown through that and you've relapsed, you're in a worse situation and it's a bit harder to cure. So again, what would happen if you were a younger patient, you were fit and you weren't a booze and a drinker, um, then you get salvage chemotherapy, the details of which we don't need to uh, worry about, but it's relatively intensive, and if you're young and you have an early recurrence, we do hit you very hard at the ostom. And we collect the stem cells, but we only transplant patients who are responsive to their salvage chemotherapy. So if you have relapsed large cell lymphoma, you get this intensive chemotherapy and you don't respond, the lymphoma doesn't shrink down, doing a transplant is a waste of time. It does not cure patients in the context. So you have to be what we call, call chemosensitive responsive. And then we will often hit, we will do a transplant. Often we use in those younger patients an um, aggressive chemotherapy regimen called bisophan and milfam, which I'll briefly mention. Remember I mentioned before that large cell lymphoma is not one of those diseases that's particularly responsive to, a, to the donor immune system? 
it's probably the least responsive. So it's very rarely that we would do a transplant and allograft if they relapse after an autograft. Having said that, one of my patients at the moment is in at Royal Melbourne actually having that, but generally we don't do that very much. In general, we would look at some new clinical trials, and if those of you can last till the ne my next talk in an hour or so, I'll talk about some new clinical trials in this context. So this is a case study. This is a young man that I saw just the other day. He, um, at the age of about, i do my maths here, in his late 20s, he presented with the symptoms that you can see there. He had really bad lymphoma. He had extensive bone marrow involvement. His PET scan showed widespread disease, and he was really quite sick at the time. Those of you who know what a PET scan looks like, have never looked at a PET scan. Um, this is your bladder, so your bladder, this is your bladder will be black in your bladder, but the rest of your body should be basically have no black spots. So he's got, there's a lot of black there, he's got lots of, uh, the principle behind a PET scan is you inject somebody with a, with a, a labelled glucose, and lymphoma is very, it likes glucose, it sucks it up, and the, and the radioactive dye gets focused in those areas where the glucose is uptake, and then you scan them, and when, and when you get black when there's glucose. So this is lymphoma, I can tell you this is probably the worst PET scan I've ever seen. So he got R-TROP chemotherapy every two weeks, um, debated about the two versus three weeks, we decided to give him two weeks and he got better, temporarily. So I remember seeing him up on the ward, come in for his fourth cycle of R-TROP and I said, oh, can't say his name, Bob, how are you going? And he said, oh, actually I've got this fevers and sweats back, so I feel crap. Went to blood test, his LDH, which is a mark of lymphoma, went up again. We did another PET scan and it still showed widespread avid disease. So he was in deep doo-doo, I can tell you. So in general, Patients who are refractory or resistant to R-TROP chemotherapy have a very, very poor prognosis. Um, anyway, he was young. We decided to give him a crack. So we gave him augmented rice, this very intensive uh, regimen, not without side effects. He got very low neutropenic, got very low blood counts, got a bacteria in his blood, ended up in ICU with what's called septic shock. Got out of that. We said, well, we'll give you, give you another cycle. And he got... One of the drugs is called Aplastamide. If you give it in funny doses, some, in high doses, some people get encephalopathy where they go crazy. So, so he went crazy for a while, but we pushed on. Um, and he, we collected his stem cells off the back of cycle two. His PET scan was negative, which was extraordinary. We don't see this very often, which is why I'm presenting this case. And then we, we, we went ahead and did a transplant with our intravenous disulfan, which is a, which is a very aggressive sort of uh, chemotherapy-based regimen and he remains alive, and I saw him just a week, he remains now alive three years later. He wasn't, he wasn't transplanted in two, <laughs> yeah, a thousand years from now. Interesting when you see the typos. I go through all my slides religiously and check them all out, and I often find mistakes when I'm giving the talk. So he's now done remarkably well. So this is a really unusual, unusual case that I've selected because it was a great case, um, but it's, it's not the norm. So, Patients who relapse after R-TROP with large lymphoma often don't respond particularly well, or even if they have an autograph, they may relapse as well. So there really is a need for novel therapies. So what's happening, and I'll talk about this a bit later on my next talk, is that what we're trying to do with lymphoma is give better treatments up front rather than waiting for patients to relapse. As you mentioned before, as I mentioned before, there are a whole lot of genetic pathways in lymphoma cells that are abnormal in patients with lymphoma. And rather than give a sort of general widespread chemotherapy like the CHOP bit of R-CHOP, we're now trying to focus on blocking those abnormal pathways that are overactivated within the cell. So the specific designer drugs that are designed to, to stop the overactive genes which are characterised by lymphoma. So there are a number of trials now using R-CHOP with another specific drug to try and reduce the risk of relapse. The other thing that we're looking at doing is, is boosting the patient's immune system. So, you know, perhaps it may be that a lot of us are getting little malignant cells in our body the, ho the whole time and we, our immune system eradicates them. And we know, for example, when our immune system is suppressed by steroids or old age or hepatitis viruses, that we have a higher risk of lymphoma. So we need to have a good immune system. And patients with lymphoma, who have lymphoma, their immune systems fail to recognise lymphoma and get rid of it. So there's now a whole sort of interest in boosting the patient's immune system by using various drugs that can do that, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Those, so for example, there's been now, those of you who would have followed the Jimmy Stein story and the Ron Walker story, that part of the reason why 
those particular individuals did reasonably well with their melanomas because they got drugs which boosted their immune system and now that's moving into the haematology area. So, try to be brief, that's large cell lymphoma. Any questions about that? You're either asleep or you're understanding everything or not entirely sure. Any questions about that? The autograph was the, the, the cell, cell thing, wasn't it? The, the, so the, auto, the autograph is when the patient has their cells collected yeah. out of their bloodstream, yeah. uh, frozen down I in a li bit liquid nitrogen tank, yeah. and then it's when the patient goes ahead and gets the high-dose chemotherapy, if you didn't give them their stem cells back, they would die because their bone marrow would be destroyed. So you have to put their stem cells back in, which grow back in their bone marrow and restore their blood counts. Yeah, thank you. And you can know when patients have an autograph because you go in the room and you have to, when you freeze the stem cells down, you have to put them with a preservative to stop the ice crystals messing up the cell. So it's, that preservative has a real particular smell and you can walk in the room and smell whose patients have had a transplant. <laughs> yeah? Sorry? Uh, probably, uh, yeah, it's a good question. I think a very mild one. I mean, it's not, so if you have melanoma, do you have an increased risk of lymphoma? I, I remember looking at this a few years ago. I think the answer is yes, slightly. Not a strong one, though. And, and what did Ron Walker have? I don't know. A lot of, I, I presume he had a melanoma and he went to, um, he went to the US and got access to one of, the, to these, one of these immune stimulating drugs. You, you'll, do you remember that, that, that story about this guy in America that wanted to have melanoma, they wanted to get access to the drug and he couldn't get it? Yeah. Uh, I think that Ron somehow, look, I may be wrong, don't quote, don't quote me on this, but my understanding is he may have somehow got access to the drug, which has now subsequently been approved in Australia. But unfortunately, that guy in the US couldn't get it and he died. Okay, so that's large cell lymphoma. Let's move on to low-grade lymphoma. So most, so low-grade lymphoma, as we've heard before, is, you know, is a complex disease. Um, most, probably two-thirds of patients I see with low-grade lymphoma, I don't do anything for them. I just leave them alone because many of them don't have any symptoms. And I was telling somebody before, you know, my, um, I saw a guy who ended up being our, our family dentist who uh, it took 12 years. I first saw him in 2009, I only treated him in 2012. Um, so often doing nothing is the right thing. He's had 12 years of quality of life without us doing anything. If it's just a one little blob in your neck, which is uncommon, occasionally you may just give some local radiotherapy. And also, with the new treatments available, in the, at least in the context of trial, we've, we've uh, put, uh, I think, about 12 patients with newly diagnosed low-grade lymphoma in various trials with bendamustine, the drug, drug we mentioned before, and some of them have got a new antibody called GA101 and none of those patients have relapsed so far. So, so in fact, you know, it's hopefully becoming less of a common disease to have relapse, but nevertheless it does in some patients. And if they do relapse, we give them, again, if they're young and of a transplantable age, we will give them some further chemotherapy. Now, I, I don't want to go into great detail here, um, because it depends what treatment you've had. If you've had RCVP in the past, we may add, we may escalate by adding another drug. Um, some patients in private, uh, actually, I know Cabrini actually buy bendamustine. You can import it and pay for it. It's not as expensive as brentuximab. And at the Austin now, uh, just in, uh, in the next week or so, we're going to activate a study in patients with relapsed low-grade lymphoma getting bendamustine. So it's attractive for us to be involved in the study because we get free drug, which is not currently available in PBS. Rituximab and another very new exciting drug called abrutinib, which is one of those selective drugs that blocks one of those pathways within the cell. And then if, if uh, you need to decide whether you're going to transplant these patients, and that gets a bit controversial. Because um, let's say you've got one of these new therapies, what we don't know, if you get a remission, how long that's going to last for. Because new therapies may be completely older things, and it may, it may be that you get a very long, uh, prolonged remission with that. And because these new therapies have just recently become available, we don't have 10-year or 15-year follow-up to see how long the responses are going to be. So it's controversial. But at least until recently, if, we, if I had somebody under the age of 60 who had relapsed low-grade lymphoma 
they had relapsed relatively early after the initial treatment, I was concerned about them, we would consider having a discussion about a transplant. As I've mentioned before, there are two sorts of transplants. The allograft was from a, a, a donor, a sibling, or an unrelated donor. An autograph was using your own cells. As I've also mentioned, the lymphoma, which is most responsive to the immune effects of having donor cells, is low-grade lymphoma. So our preference generally in Melbourne, if you have bad enough low-grade lymphoma to require a transplant, and you have a sibling or a well-matched unrelated donor, is to do an unrelated or is to do a, a transplant from that donor because the relapse rates are relatively low. So this is uh, an update courtesy of my colleague at Royal Melbourne called Andrew Lim. I, I worked at Royal Melbourne for about 20 years in the transplant unit and many of these patients were mine. And they looked at 30 patients who had an allograph of follicular lymphoma, um, average age in their late 40s, most of them from siblings, but about a third from an unrelated transplant in fact, And a number of them have had actually transformation to a more aggressive lymphoma. And that's their overall survival, which is about 70% uh, at about, you can see with long-term follow-up down the bottom axis there, of about eight years, which is pretty good. And, so, and the relapse rate, so out of those 30 patients, one, two, three, four, there have been only five relapses. So that's only 25 of those patients remain in remission. So this is actually one of those patients. So she was a woman born in 1942, a Dutch lady. She was diagnosed with lymphoma around in her late 50s, got a remission in the pre-rituximab era, she just got CVP, uh, but relapsed relatively early, sort of two years later on, and got chemotherapy with, by then rituximab became, became available in late 2003, and she got a combination with fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, and rituximab, and got a remission. She had an identif uh, a compatible brother identified who was suitable to be a donor, and she had by reduced intensity chemotherapy, I mean not really strong treatment, so we're going to kill them from the side effects of the chemotherapy. It's relatively gentle treatment. And the idea behind that is to allow, is to suppress the patient's immune system a lot, uh, to allow the donor cells to grow back in the body. Because if, if I had my sister standing here and I just got her cells infused into me, I would reject those cells. So we need to suppress my immune system enough to allow my sister, I don't know if I want my sister's cells, but anyway, to grow, to grow in, in, in my body. So we gave her some gentle chemotherapy regimen aiming to try and get an immune effect of the donor cells from her brother against the lymphoma. Does that make sense? That's called a graft versus lymphoma effect. The graft is the donor cells. Think about grafting tomatoes. So she had this transplant in 2004. I saw her the other week. She's now in remission for about a decade and she's had a little bit of problem with with side effects of the transplant, including some what's called graft versus host disease. The downside of having a transplant from a donor is you may have fantastic graft versus lymphoma effects, but you may also have some effects of the immune system of the donor against the other parts of your body, be it skin or gut or lung or whatever. So transplants are complicated. Um, but nevertheless, we feel that the relapse rate is so low after transplants for low-grade lymphoma that this side effect is, is worthwhile in selected patients. So not everybody. So I've been concentrating on this, on this talk generally on patients who were, are relatively young, so perhaps up to the age of the mid-60s. When I first started doing transplants in Vancouver in 1989, the upper age limit for a transplant from a donor was 40. And then as, so that was, what, 25 years ago, it's probably now in the mid-60s. So it's interesting how it continues to increase. And in fact, some people in America, some units in America actually transplant patients in there early 70s. Jason, what's the oldest patient you've transplanted at Royal Brisbane? Uh, our age limit's 70, so... Yeah. yeah. It's, it's gone up 30 years. As the transplanters get older, the age gets older. So, <laughs> I think the important point is that not all patients will require urgent treatment. Um, and that, as I mentioned there, that, that new clinical trials are crucial. And, and of all the... The reason I'm really interested in lymphoma is because people are sort of dissecting out what what causes, what, what is abnormal in the lymphoma cells. And we're now, this is an age, we're really in the era now of a whole lot of new treatments coming online for lymphoma. And it's really exciting. And sort of barely a, a week or a couple of weeks go, goes past without a new trial being offered to, to me at the Austin. And most of the time we have to say no because we've got so many trials we can't, we can't do them all. And I think it's a really, I don't want anybody to have lymphoma, but it's a good era to get it, if you know what I mean, in a, in a nice sense. <coughs> 
And occasionally, just occasionally, we have to accept that lymphoma is incurable and embrace good palliative care. I think it's important to, 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 uh, to recognise that, that sometimes we lose, particularly in patients with, with large cell lymphoma and some patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma, and then we have to look after them. We don't want them to blast them with unnecessary chemotherapy and looking after them at the end of their life with appropriate dignity and without inappropriate chemotherapy, I think is very important and we need to have perspective to do that. So I think, okay, so just in my last few things. So if you happen to have relapse, the first thing is um, you need to, particularly if you have low grade lymphoma, has my lymphoma changed? Is it really lymphoma or could it be something else? Will my case be assessed at a multidisciplinary team meeting? So the Austin, every two weeks, every patient with a newly diagnosed or relapsed lymphoma gets, a, gets a discussed in a meeting where we have the radiologists, we have the radiotherapists, we have the PET scan people, we have the pathologists looking at the biopsy, and we have uh, the, the registrars and consultants as well. So we discuss patients in great detail. Is not treating the lymphoma a reasonable option? So yes, sometimes with people with low-grade lymphoma. What treatments are available now? Very complex discussion. There's all these clinical trials that I've mentioned there come up. Um, can I be cured? How we assess my response to treatment? Importantly, who will be my care coordinator? So we're very, we're lucky at the Austin because I have a, a colleague called uh, Peter Shuttleworth who works very closely with me. He's my nurse counsellor who gets heavily involved in the care of patients with myeloma and lymphoma because I don't necessarily have time to answer all the questions that patients have, which are entirely appropriate. And through sponsorship from pharmaceutical companies and other sources, we employ Peter to help look after our patients. And those of you at the Austin probably know him. He's not paid for by the hospital. So we do have to raise money to support, support this. And I think that's incredibly important. Um, and also, Make it clear how much you want to know. So I, I, I had a patient many years ago who, I, who had, didn't have lymphoma, had another form of hemological malignancy who I told her, her prognosis and she got really upset with me and threatened to sue me because I told her what her prognosis was. So uh, I now make it very clear, Mrs Smith, do you want me to tell you about your prognosis, yes or no? If you don't want to know, that's fine, but uh, it, helps, it helps for us in communication with our patients to realise what you want to know. And sometimes people have a whole lot of questions and they forget them. And I tell people, have a bit of pad by your bed and when you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning worrying about your lymphoma and you have a question, write it down and bring it in. Um, if the doctor's been too technical, let them know. And also, a lot of patients come in, you know, they, they, they've Googled everything and they ask me these questions. So it's very important to try and get some perspective from your doctor because what you see on a website doesn't necessarily give you the perspective of what's going on. So a little comic down the, and, and to stay ahead, we probably need faster internet, internet access. So just, just I think the second last slide. So the challenges that we face is we're time poor. So forgive us if we look, we don't mean to be uncaring, but often in clinic, for example, we have 10 or 12 patients to see. We have quarter an hour allocated for each. Um, and that's why it's very important down the bottom here of the nurse counsellors to share the load, provide, provide you've got a, a nurse counsellor like Peter who is very educated and, and can help the patient along their journey. We also have to be aware that what you, when you come and see us for whatever period of time, that behind the scenes probably treble the amount of time that we spend looking after you. So we're looking at your CAT scans, we have pathology meetings where we look at your biopsy, we have this multidisciplinary meetings, we dictate letters, we chase results, we chart the chemotherapy. So behind the scenes there's hours and hours of work that go on. Um, and one of the issues that we have, you know, is people, my registrars, stopping me in the, in, the reg in the corridor and saying, what about Mrs Bloggs who's got this, what are we going to do? And I've got, had other patients on my, on my mind. We are do give it overload, so we have to be, I think we do pretty well to get it right most of the time. And sometimes we're tired. Um, and while our job is to convey empathy, I apologise sometimes if we're so knackered we don't look as caring as we should be, but we, we perhaps could do better about that. Um, so that's my last slide, a nice peaceful sunset slide. And now I'm happy to have your questions. Because we've got, how long have we got? Ooh, it's over. It's over? So any questions and then we'll head up to level Oh, give me, give me time, give me two more questions. Two questions, anybody got a question? Yes. What is the bottom line? What's the difference if you like it between a low grade and a high grade? Okay. And in the case of a low grade, is that a that ejection factor? Okay, so the, the first part of the question, so low-grade lymphoma, 
there's a whole variety of conditions that are low-grade lymphoma, but the commonest one is called a follicular lymphoma. And then what that means, when you look under the microscope, you see little follicles and little circles of lymphoma cells. And, and their lymphomas, they're called low-grade because they often grow very slowly. Often they don't grow at all. Um, I saw a patient the other day, or just on, on Wednesday, who's, who's my dentist, and he's got low-grade lymphoma, another dentist, and uh, his glands have gone away spontaneously. So often people with low-grade lymphoma run a very sleepy course. Whereas the more aggressive lymphomas, so the high-grade lymphomas, the commonest one is the diffuse large cell lymphoma. When you look under the microscope, you don't see these little nodules or follicles. You see large cells diffusely um, invading the gland. And you, those patients generally require treatment because it's an aggressive lymphoma. Some patients do very well, don't they, Ireland? OK. Any other questions you'd like to? Yes, down the back. In, in the instance, you were talking about pregtaxaban being so expensive that yeah. it's not previous and it's not approved. But you still can access it if you're prepared to pay for that problem. Yeah. Okay. So, so the, question, the question that I'm actually asking yeah. is, is if you actually have someone mm -hmm. that is say, oh, I'm prepared to take one or two treatments just to see how it goes when yeah. I'm going to respond to it, just from that res clinical response perspective, mm -hmm. Can you utilise that as an argument to the government to say, look, you know, we've had a fabulous response so far on this particular drug for this particular patient? Can we use some sort of discretionary decision with maybe part funding it so that we can get the full course of So, so the answer is not with government. Isn't it? No, you can't. It, it, it doesn't happen uh, unless. Perhaps you may go to your local member of parliament whether they can do something, but in general that's, that doesn't work. So what would work? Who, who so you could approach... There are three ways of, of accessing expensive drugs. Occasionally people have private insurance. Some of the private insurance companies will support the drug and some don't. Um, some companies will say if it's TGA approved, so, so in, in Australia you can have a drug approved for marketing, and Brentuximab is one of those drugs which is approved for marketing, but it's not on the PBS, so it's not funded. There's a difference. And so um, some companies will say if a drug is approved for marketing and there's a clinical need, we will support the cost of that drug. Other insurance companies will say if it's not on the PBS, we are not going to support it. I've been in that, down in that track many times. So it depends whether you're with HBO or Medicare Bank Private or Boopa or whatever. They do vary, um, but they try and save money, so they usually say no. The other way is to um, is to pay for it yourself, uh, which happens in in some patients, as you know. And the other way at the Austin is that generally we would, if we have a very strong case to use an expensive drug like brentuximab, we will generally perhaps go to our, our director of pharmacy here and sit down. We have a meeting with a number of people where we discuss it and say we will give a number of cycles. We will give, for example, two cycles of this treatment and see how they go, and they may fund up to the, the general rule of thumb at the Austin is that generally we, we can get away with something up to about 20 grand and beyond that we're in trouble. So we may give a couple of cycles of an expensive treatment up to 20 grand and then if, if a patient responds well we try and sit down and what to do next. And, that, and then it gets tough. Yeah, I, I do have one other question. Yeah. Um, just in, uh, from a perspective of, of um, what's going on outside clinical trials, because there are obviously patients who have got the final who's funded his own treatment who's mm -hmm. very successfully treated by the way. Um, um, how can those that are outside of the trial system contribute to the collective knowledge okay, of the use of these drugs? I mean, how, how do we actually grow that thing? Yeah, that's... So I know that in one case in Brisbane at the moment, there is someone who is getting stem cell treatment Okay, for, for mm. okay. He's outside the trial situation. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. so, so we're we're obliged to contribute all our, our our transplant results, for example, to a Australian bone marrow transplant registry. So all our data is is uh, contributed to a centre in Sydney, and, and often they publish our results. Uh, we also at the Austin, most hospitals now have a have a database. So. When you go to a multidisciplinary meeting with your newly diagnosed lymphoma, that gets all in, in, in a database. So we can, uh, 
interrogate that database to get results and share things from a collaborative point of view if need be. So, so irrespective of whether you're on a trial or not. Okay, so thank you for listening to me and putting up with me. We're